sure is hot out here. You know, I don't mind though. Just glad to be free. You know what I'm saying? Breathe love. Breathe love. Boom. Boom. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg, senior pastor here at Park Avenue Church in Minneapolis. I want you to know I'm so glad you're here and part of Park Avenue's online worship. From wherever you're watching, welcome. You know, we're coming up on a year since the coronavirus changed our lives. And I want you to know I'm so proud of our church and for the way folks have continued to be the church, even in this pandemic. Approaching 130 years now, Park Avenue has been weathering all kinds of storms. Faithful to follow the wind of God's spirit. We are resilient, we are strong, we are creative, and we are leaning in to this future with hope and energy faithful to our commitment to follow Jesus, to love and be loved as he calls us to, and to love the neighborhood and this neighborhood and the world, which, by the way, God so loves. And I count it a great joy to be on this journey with you. If you'd like to keep up to date uh, about what's happening at Park, I'd love to send you our weekly newsletter. All you have to do is go to our website, parkavchurch.org. Click the Stay Up to Date button at the top of the page to sign up. And if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube as usual, I hope you'll click that Share button to include others in the goodness of Park Avenue. As you probably know, every day this month, we're celebrating Black history by posting on our Facebook page these great stories about Black Americans who've shaped our lives. Uh, check it out on our Facebook page to learn about some amazing people. And now here's our call to worship. We are invited to journey through this season of Lent toward the one who calls us each by name. We're called to walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, acknowledging our fears, our doubts, our longings, and not allowing them to control us. We seek to trust the God who always surprises us, whose promises take on flesh and blood, take on our flesh and blood to embody the good news called Jesus. And now I wonder if you'll help me welcome uh, three remarkable folks, Marcial, Sandy, and Christine, with this incredible version of Reach Out and Touch. May this inspire you. May this inspire us to take a little time out of our day to encourage one another along the way. <laughs> Let's worship together. This morning, we would like to give some encouragement to all of you that may be watching or listening to Park Avenue United Methodist Church. I'm encouraging you today to reach out and touch somebody. I know we're in COVID-19. It makes it kind of hard. Pick up your phone and just call a friend or a neighbor and tell them that you're thinking about them, that you love them. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Take a little time out of your busy day to show and 
give encouragement to someone that might have lost their way? Or would I be talking into a stone if I asked you to share a problem that's not your own? We can change things if we start giving. You can if you see an old friend on the street and he's down just remember his shoes can fit your feet try the little kindness you'll see that it goes so Good morning, Park Avenue. This is Minister Darrell Williams. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for intercessory prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the ability to speak to you directly. What a privilege it is to come before you and to know that you are listening. May we never forget the power of having an elevated conversation with the creator of the universe. Although the trials we face are perilous, no matter the trial, Nothing is too difficult for you to handle. Lord, we place our hearts in your hands, believing fully in the restorative power of healing that only you can provide. As a nation, our hearts are heavy with grief due to the COVID-19 pandemic that has taken half a million mothers, fathers, grandparents, sons, daughters, siblings, cousins, and friends. Let us take a moment of silence to remember those who we lost. Psalm 3119 voices our pain. Be merciful to us, O Lord. We are in distress. Our eyes grow weak with sorrow, our souls and our bodies with grief. Our hearts are broken, our minds exhausted. We cry out to you and hardly know what to ask. All we can do is tell you how we feel, 
and ask that you keep track of all our sorrows. Collect all our tears in your bottle. Record each and every one in your book as we pour them out to you. Your word tells us, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Lord, we are mourning as a nation. Please send your comfort to wrap around us, to hold us and protect us in your perfect will, to give us hope for tomorrow and the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, teach us that your ways are not our ways. Though the crosses we bear in attempt to follow you may be heavy, we may grow weary, but let us not grow weary in well-doing. Let us march on till victory is truly won. The prophet Isaiah writes, For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord, we stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters in the southern states who've experienced power grid outages in sub-zero weather. Lord, we ask for relief to be deployed swiftly for those in the most vulnerable situations. Lord, please send your comfort to families who may have lost loved ones as a result of these events. Lord, wrap them in your arms and fill them with your love. May the Holy Spirit inhabit the homes of your people as they are attempting to get their homes back in order. Now let us wrap this up in the prayer that you have taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I will be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Forever and ever. Amen. Hello everyone, I am Stephen Belton, a longtime member of the preaching staff here at Park Avenue Church. Today, February 28th, is the second Sunday of Lent, which is the 40-day season beginning on Ash Wednesday, leading up to the death of Jesus Christ on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Lent is a period of purposeful reflection and repentance to show solidarity with the suffering Savior and renew our hearts before God. Our message today is taken from the New Testament book of Mark, chapter 8 and verses 31 through 38. If you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone or tablet, I invite you to read along with me. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. 
Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, I will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forget and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If I was to tag a title to this text, it would be The Dictates of Discipleship. The Dictates of Discipleship. Pray with me, please. Eternal God, may my meditation, preparation, dissertation, and exhortation be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are my rock, my refuge, and my redeemer. This is my prayer, and all who agree before the Lord say together, Amen and Amen. The dictates of discipleship. A wise woman who was traveling in the mountains found a precious stone in a stream. The next day she met another traveler who was hungry and the wise woman opened her bag to share her food. The hungry traveler saw the precious stone and asked the woman to give it to him. She did so without hesitation. The traveler left rejoicing in his good fortune he knew that the stone was worth enough to give him security for a lifetime. But a few days later, he came back to return the stone to the wise woman. I've been thinking, he said. I know how valuable the stone is, but I give it back in the hope that you can give me something even more precious. Give me what you have within you that enabled you to give me the stone. That story by an unknown author illustrates a central tension within today's text, and that is the question of the cost and benefit of sacrificing self for a higher good. In our scripture today, Jesus reveals to his disciples for the first time that he must be ridiculed, rejected, suffer, and put to death. And on the third day following his death, he will rise again. The text says that Jesus said these things quite openly, that is, for all to hear, not just his intimate circle of disciples. And he said these things quite openly was in juxtaposition also to the parables that he often told, which were sometimes confusing to the disciples. He said these things quite openly. Jesus' prediction of suffering was surprising and unwelcome news for the disciples, especially Peter, who had just confessed that he believed Jesus was the Messiah. Back in verses 27 through 30, Jesus asked the disciples what people are saying about him and what they believe about him. Peter, who was always the most outspoken, said, you are the Messiah. For centuries, Jews had waited for a savior prophesied in scripture who would free them from oppression and captivity. They envisioned a Messiah as a military conqueror 
who would ride to their rescue, not someone who would experience the pain and persecution so many Jews had endured. So when Jesus launched into his lecture about his impending suffering and death, the disciples weren't trying to hear that. Jesus took Peter aside, excuse me, Peter took Jesus aside and began to reproach him. Ha, <laughs> you missed that, beloved. Go back and witness the contrast between Jesus, who publicly prophesies God's will, and Peter, who is about to speak against God's will in private. You ever notice how the truth gravitates to the light and lies seek the shadows? Jesus spoke openly, but Peter tried to hide his words. We don't know if Peter didn't want to embarrass Jesus or if he anticipated Jesus' rebuke and didn't want to play himself. But we know that Peter tried to scold his master. Can you imagine what that sounded like? <laughs> Jesus, I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm going to need you to stop all that talk about rejection at the hands of the elders. And for heaven's sake, stop telling the disciples that you are going to suffer and be put to death. You're scaring the living daylights out of them, and you're making me look like a fool. We've got a good thing going here, Jesus. Your preaching is off the chain. People are coming from everywhere to hear you speak, and they can't get enough of your miracles. We're about to pick up market share in Bethsaida, Gerasim, Tyre, Galilee, Nazareth, and even Samaria is coming online. You're about to blow up, Jesus. We can make this thing go worldwide. Syndication, a book deal, action figures, maybe even Netflix. Just don't mess around with the message, Jesus. Stop scaring people with this talk about death and suffering. Nobody wants to hear that. Okay, okay, maybe my spiritual imagination ran away just a little bit right there. But you get the picture, right? Peter and the disciples were frightened about the revelation from Jesus that they were not on a trajectory for triumph, but on a collision course for calamity. But if Peter didn't want to hear Jesus talk about his crucifixion and death, he really wasn't prepared for what Jesus said and did next. The scripture says, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Did you get that? Looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. In other words, Jesus was calling out the whole lot of them, holding all the disciples accountable for what Peter had said. And he called out Satan's influence on Peter's thought process. The root word of Satan is adversary. And Jesus was telling the enemy to get out of his way. Then Jesus spoke to the crowd that had gathered with the disciples and began to teach them the true cost of discipleship. If any want to become my followers, he said, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Ah, you may have missed another one, beloved. I know I missed it the first times I read the text. Jesus said, if any want to become my followers. In other words, just because you're in the crowd doesn't make you a disciple. An old expression says, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a chicken coop will make you a chicken. <laughs> Instead, Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Let me say a few words about these three dictates of discipleship. First, deny yourself. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, what it does not mean is that we are to deprive ourselves of a particular pleasure, comfort, or thing. Jesus was not advocating a life of self-inflicted pain or self-imposed poverty. This is the same Jesus, after all, who said, I came that they might have life and have it, what, more abundantly. Jesus warned about the dangers of materialism in other occasions, but this dictate to deny self was not specifically about physical possession or experiences of the body. Jesus was telling us to surrender our will to God, to denounce our desires in deference to the divine. Let me illustrate using Jesus himself as an example. 
On the night before he was betrayed, Jesus took refuge in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was described as distressed, agitated, and deeply grieved about the impending events that would culminate at the cross. Jesus prayed, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. That simple prayer captures the essence of what it means to deny ourselves. It is an internal transition from self-orientation to spiritual direction. Not what I want, Father, but what you want. Not my desire, but your desire. Not my priority, but your priority. Not my plans, but your plans. Not my time, but your time. Not my call, but your call. Not my will, but your will. Theologian Victor Barajid Cole writes, self stands in the way of genuine discipleship and prevents identifying with Jesus should suffering become necessary. Deny yourself is the first dictate of discipleship. Let's move on. The second dictate for discipleship is to take up your cross. If you don't want to become my followers, excuse me, if you want to become my followers, Jesus said, let them deny themselves and take up their cross. Jesus did not instruct us to take up his cross. He said, take up your cross. We know that Jesus had a cross to bear, but what is your cross to bear? In Jesus' time, the cross was both an implement of capital punishment and a symbol of the consequences to those who challenged Rome's oppressive power and authority. Death on a cross was an unbelievably cruel public branding that marked you as a conquered threat to the established order. The cross represented permanent exile by death. When Jesus tells us to take up our cross, he unequivocally, unapologetically is saying we must accept the risk of faith in him, which could mean alienation, humiliation, persecution, and even death. Take up your cross is a call to share in the suffering of Christ for the sake of the gospel. It also means to embrace the cross as a brand or symbol of opposition to unjust practices that oppress, marginalize, displace, exploit, and victimize the least lost and last. Is this making sense to anybody? It makes good sense to me. Take up your cross is a call to action. We take up our cross when we stand for peace and against violence, when we speak up for love and against hate, when we march for justice and against corruption, when we stand for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and against regression, privilege, and exclusion. There is both need and opportunity to take up our cross right in front of us every day, beloved. The question for each of us that we each must ask, especially during this season of Lent, is will I pick up my cross and follow Jesus to the cross? An old song of the church that I love says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Take up your cross, church. Take up your cross. Deny self. Take up your cross. And the third and final dictate for discipleship is to follow me. That is, follow Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, then follow Jesus. Don't try to lead. Follow. Don't set your own course or try to dictate the pace. Follow. Don't suggest alternative routes or shortcuts. Follow. Don't back seat drive. Follow. And don't continuously ask, are we there yet? Follow. This may seem simple or even condescending instruction, but Jesus understood it's easy for us to get confused about our role on this Christian journey. We need encouragement to suppress the urge to take the wheel. We are not in the lead, beloved. Our role is to follow Jesus. Jesus is the leader. 
Peter got this twisted. He got confused when he heard that Jesus had mapped out a course for misery. Thinking of his human desire rather than godly goals, Peter tried to take the lead, but Jesus would not be moved off course. And that is the good news this morning, beloved. Jesus cannot be moved off course. Peter forgot his place, but Jesus remembered his mercy. Peter tried to change course, but Jesus was committed to the cross. Peter was fretting about himself, but Jesus was focused on humanity. Peter fought for false freedom, but Jesus was faithful to his father. If we learn nothing else from this scripture, it is that Jesus points and leads the way to God, and he will not be moved from his mission to save the least, the lost, and the last. I don't know about you, beloved, but I'm glad Jesus leads and grateful for the invitation to follow. On my own, I am aimless and lost, but in Christ, I have purpose and am found. Maybe you've been trying to lead and find yourself going in circles or going nowhere fast. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are called to surrender our will to God, stand up for the things that please God, and follow the teaching and example of Jesus Christ. These are the dictates of discipleship. I wonder what the wise said to the hungry traveler who had asked her to give him whatever was in her that enabled her to give away the precious stone. I imagine she said, deny self, take up your cross, follow Jesus. Amen. Give myself away Ooh Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Hey, I give myself away so you can use me. My life is not my own. You I belong I give myself I give myself to you Oh my life is not my own to you I belong I give myself I give myself to you I give myself away Hey, I give myself away so you can use me. As we close, I wonder if you'd give me the gift of lending me your eyes just for a moment through the screen and if you would receive this word of grace to this one who is able to keep you from falling. And even when you do fall, it is more than able to pick you back up and bring you in fullness before God's glorious presence. To Jesus, our Savior, be glory and majesty, power and honor, and to Jesus alone. And as we say every week, join me. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. We can, we can do, do all things. All things. Through Jesus through Christ, Christ who, who strengthens, strengthens us. us. Amen. Oh! Brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you back to life. Back to the one that can make your next chapter your best chapter. Hallelujah. How can it be? Thank you for being with us and breathing love during this season. As we hope to soon be together, let us continue to be the light in our community. If you would like more information on how to be involved, please email us at info at parkavchurch.org. Park Avenue Church is sustained by generous people who include Park in their financial giving. Give safely and securely by using our online or text to give options. Thank you and God bless.
is. All right, God bless you. We'll see you later. Come on, Ryan, let's get out of here. Superhero, brother. <laughs> let's go.